Welcome to Gustavo's Clocky Thesis Award, the 27th edition. Of course, welcome to all of you connected through YouTube or LinkedIn. Uh, welcome to the representatives of the organizing associations, in this case, the Society of Petroleum Engineers Italian Section, the Italian Section of the European Association of Geoscientists and Engineers, uh, together with the Society of Exploration Geophysicists, so IAG SEG, and to Asso Mineraria, and uh, especially welcome to the winners of this edition of the award. Now, this is for us a happy event, of course, because when you win something, you are always happy, but I think it's happy for all of us because in, today we are celebrating excellence. We had uh, a, a set of young guys and ladies who gave their best to do their thesis work. We had a picky and demanding uh, evaluation committee, and this evaluation committee judged this thesis to be outstanding. And uh, we think that uh, when we have young ladies and gentlemen doing their best, uh, we also have best hopes for our future. So it's a very happy day for everyone. Uh, tonight, if we were let's say, meeting in person and not on the web, we would be on a prestigious Aula Magna of Politecnico di Milano. And actually, we are pretending to be there. I mean, we, we want to be there, even if it's, this is not possible. So I immediately leave the floor to Alberto Guadagnini, Professor Alberto Guadagnini and Department Head, who is giving his welcome to their, let's say, virtual Aula Magna tonight. Alberto Guadagnini. Thank you, Alberto, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, let me start by introducing myself. I'm Alberto Guadagnini, and I'm a professor at here at the Politecnico di Milano, and I currently serve as director of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. I'm particularly tied to SPE as I'm faculty advisor of the SPE student chapter at Politecnico di Milano, and uh, it gives me really a true and genuine pleasure to have the honor to welcome you this 27th edition of the Gustavo Sclocchi Thesis Award. Like Alberto said, I wish that we that this event would have been held in what can be said as the most prestigious room in the Politecnico di Milano like we did last year. And believe me, it was a wonderful setting. It still is. And I'm confident that this will be an exciting and memorable experience for all of us tonight. I'm, of course, very much grateful to Italian section of SPE, EAGE, and Asso Mineraria for their continuous and unwavering support to this event, providing many young and talented, and talented researchers and students with such a unique opportunity to showcase their work and, active, and achievements. While representing here Politecnico di Milano, uh, which as all of you very well know, is a key technological university in Italy, Europe, and worldwide, from a personal standpoint, I, <clears throat> I very much related to SPE through my research activities, which span from reservoir engineering, fluid and transport processes in porous media, as well as the SPE student chapter. The latter I'm particularly fond of, and it has been set about four years ago and has been continuously growing uh, in terms of members and the setup of a variety of exciting activity during all these years. I've always encouraged uh, all of our students uh, from master's students to the PhD level to submit their best work to this wonderful competition. And to be honest, I'm very much excited to see that the quality of the works awarded is increasing year by year, setting ever increasing standards. Topics associated with the awards and mentioned this year are truly exciting and amazing and they encompass a variety of elements. They include modeling, theoretical advancements, fieldwork in various fields. I'm truly looking forward to hearing all the presentations and I hereby extend my warmest congratulations to all awardees and wish this is a nice jumping point for what I'm sure will be their future success in their career. Once again, thank you very much for being here tonight and for joining me in congratulating 
all of these wonderful young researchers for their spectacular achievements. I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fun and uh, I'm leaving the floor to Alberto. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Alberto. So now we are we are going to present the agenda. The first thing is to have some in short introductory speeches by the organizing association. So I very quickly give the floor to Marco Brignoli, the technical scientific director of the award. Marco. You are muted. And uh, uh, welcome especially to the winners, of course, but also to all the attendees. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the chairman of the Italian section who could not join us uh, today to briefly uh, talk about SPE. Uh, probably those of you who are already engaged with SPE or had something to, to do with the society already knows. For the other, we, we put together a couple of slides to give an idea of what is the Society of Petroleum Engineers. So starting with the mission and the vision uh, of, of the society, the, the mission is written there, but I, I'd really like to highlight that still is a message valid. I joined society a long time ago, and still the message and the mission is already valid. So it's important to collect, disseminate and exchange technical knowledge. And what we are doing today is to recognize an advancement in some areas of the technical knowledge. And that's the part of the vision. Vision means looking at the future. SPE moved from the traditional oil and gas business of uh, 20, 30 years ago to involving also environment and now moving to the energy transition, low carbon energy. So looking really at the future. That's important for a, a society to uh, grow not only in terms of the technical knowledge on the fundamental pillars of the society of the petroleum engineers, but also looking at the future and, <clears throat> and to what will be the evolution of the engineer uh, uh, jobs and, and activities for the next 30, 40 years. So when coming to the uh, membership, uh, just to give you uh, some numbers, SPE is more than 160 members, spread over 140 countries. And in these more than 140 countries, there are more than 200 sections. And uh, I would like to underline more than 400 student chapters. Student chapters are, are, uh, are really one of the uh, key um, structures within uh, within uh, the membership and, and the policy of SP because it's through the is through the students that become engineers or become geologists or become something else that will uh, bring the knowledge and grow uh, the, the, the the society so you may see from yourself on the lower low left uh, the division in, in countries is still heavily uh, positioned in North America, but it's spread all over, all over the world. Uh, on the upper side uh, of the slide, uh, you will see the different technical sections, technical pillars on which uh, SPE is formed. And uh, really, I would like to underline once again the uh, new um, environmental and uh, new energies and sustainability uh, areas which were not so uh, announced uh, 20 years ago. And in terms of opportunities, there's a plenty of opportunities for the singles in, in, inside the SPE. I really 
uh, the right to really underline the professional growth, the personal growth, and, and the networking with the, the other peers, with academia, and with the other companies. So it's really a, a, a melting pot, if I may use this term, uh, for which uh, SPE continue to strengthen uh, his position and the position of their affiliates. And now I leave the floor to Nicola Paiola uh, for EAG and, and SEG. Thank Alberto. Thank Marco. On behalf of EAG, I want to congratulate the winners and also thank everyone who submitted the awards. Next slides, please. EAG is a very active association, well known within the geophysical community. And it will, as it is now, continue to favor the circulation and infusion of geophysical culture. I want to take profit of this occasion to share some thought, especially with our young colleagues. Geophysical disciplines have undergone an important and constant change in recent decades. Even more in this phase of energy transition, they are called to transform themselves to respond to the change of the market and then to new technological scenarios. As has as happened in the past, with the advent of even greater computerization and availability of greater computing power, geophysics will certainly be able to adapt and provide a valuable contribution to the development of new disciplines that are emerging on the market. To do this, we will need people able to look to the future with curiosity and enthusiasm, characteristics that have always distinguished the people working in the geophysical field, whether they work in universities or in the in the industry. Next slide, please. For this reason, I urge the young geophysicists who are entering the world of work to look positively towards the future, because without a doubt, we will still need the geophysical contribution to investigate the surface and the subsurface of our planet. And then just one word about our local section. The Italian section EAG SEG brings together the two major international geophysical associations, SEG and EAG, in the same entity and wants to be the reference point in the Italian context. For this reason, I urge everyone to join the Italian section. Registration is for free. Again, congratulations to all winners, and I leave the floor back to Alberto. Thanks a lot, Marco. Thanks a lot, Nicola. Uh, tonight, uh, Luigi Ciarrocchi, the president of Asso Mineraria, could not be present with us today, but uh, he sent a message stating that for Asso Mineraria, supporting this award is a top priority and send this uh, short message to all of us that I'm just reading on his behalf. Investing in training to consolidate knowledge and skills and has always been a fundamental driver for professional development and growth. The Gustavo Sklocki Award symbolizes the proper recognition of innovation and talent. With great pleasure, I extend my most sincere Congratulations from Asso Mineraria to all the winners. So thank you, Luigi, for this uh, uh, nice message. And now we can get into the core of the award ceremony. Uh, first of all, uh, I uh, give the floor again to Marco Brignoli, who will uh, give the setup of the whole award for this year. Please, Marco. Thank you again, uh, Alberto. And uh, we can move to the next slide. So the Gustavo Sklocki Thesis Award, which now arrived to the 27th edition, was established a long time ago as a, as a prize to encourage and reward young professionals at the beginning of their career in the industry. Uh, 
It was named and dedicated to Gustavo Sklocki, uh, which was a manager in ENI and has been also chairman of the Italian section and was very, very active to promote the involvement of young, young engineers and young geologists inside the uh, professional society. <clears throat> and uh, it was uh, almost natural for, uh, for the organizing uh, society when Gustavo died uh, to uh, give in his honor the name to the prize. So, a little bit of statistics before opening the, the, the formal ceremony. So, uh, this, this slide is summarized the number of, of theses that has been received by the committee over the past 27 years. Uh, and uh, uh, in blue, uh, and we see that in the last years we all almost have constantly above 30 uh, manuscripts submitted, and the number in green of the awarded. So uh, I must say that the committee uh, has a tough uh, task to, to really identify the best in class of, of each year to, to be recognized. As a matter of a division, uh, just reporting the main categories, of course, when we started, we had only engineering, geology, and geophysics. Uh, now we have uh, also some, some other contributes uh, um, coming from economics, uh, coming from, uh, from um, let's say, not so uh, old style courses, but again, usually uh, engineering, geophysics, and geology do the, the, the are the main contributors. In terms of divisions by type, uh, you see, uh, also because it's an Italian prize also uh, for Italian to study at, outside. But again, what is the laurea uh, magistrale is the, the most uh, uh, rich number. Um, PhD as well. Bachelor started to, to uh, be inside some years ago, and some uh, second level master's contribution in the past year, especially through the cooperation with some of the Italian uh, technical university who, who provide dedicated uh, master courses to, uh, to petroleum engineering. Having said that, I have nothing more to, to say than leaving the floor to Alberto for the uh, let's say, formal um, uh, side of the cer <coughs> ceremony. Thanks, Marco. I mean, the formal and the happiest part of the ceremony, ceremony when we are really giving out the awards. We have three types of awards, Master, PhD and Laura Magistrale, the first uh, uh, section of the awards. Then uh, we have uh, uh, Bachelor and uh, Master, and then we have special mentions. Uh, it's uh, interesting to have special mentions because, uh, as, as has been said before, it's sometimes very difficult to choose because the quality of the works is very high. So we don't want to lose what we really believe is nice, is, is good quality, and this is the reason for the mentions. So now I'm going to, uh, no, let's say, award each uh, past student one by one. And uh, and uh, and give the possibility to each of you to say hello. So let's go to the first one. Uh, Luca Bianchin, low frequency reconstruction methods for elastic parameter estimation. Uh, I don't know if it's possible for him to say hello. If not, I just keep um, to the hello. Next. So can you can you show yourself? Hello. Okay, fine. Compliments. You know, it, uh, in the real event, it would be possible to shake hands. Now, this is not possible, but it's important in any case to give the floor to the to the winner. So, thank you very much, Luca. Let's go on to the second one. 
Margherita Bruscolini. Yes. BYF Cement. You will see later what BYF is an eco friendly alternative to ordinary Portland cements. That's so, correct. Compliments, Margherita. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. And yes, I'm very happy about it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So the third. Chiara Zuffetti, characterization and modeling of complex geological architectures, the quaternary fill of the Po Basin and the Po Plain Apennines border, Lombardy, Italy. Chiara. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All. Thank you. Let's go to the fourth. Uh, Giuseppe Battista Abate in the second category of the Bachelor and Master, defining the path to implement predictive maintenance of an offshore drilling business. Giuseppe. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. It's an honor to be here with all of you. Thanks a lot. Uh, compliments. Thank you. Then. Ahmed Mohamed Sadek El Gendi, carbon capture and storage modeling perspective. Ahmed. Hello, Alberto. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be with, uh, with all of you today. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot and compliments, Ahmed. Thanks. Then the first of the special mentions. Martina Balestra, Structural Thermal Evolution of the Apenninic Maghrebian Fold and Thrust Belt in the Northwest Sicily, in sight from 1D to 3D modeling. Martina. Hi. Hi to everybody. I'm, uh, I'm very happy. Thank you for this uh, special mention. Thanks for your work, Martina. Compliments. Again. Bye. Magdalena Vera Cena, risk assessment of a continuous circulation system, heart of drilling, HOD, applied to drilling operations. Magdalena. Hello, uh, thank you very much. It's an honor and thank you and congratulations to everybody. Thanks a lot and congratulations to you, Magdalena. Thank you very much. Then again, Iwan Setiawan, Seismic characterization of a late Miocene calciclastic deep water fan in the Pu Can Basin offshore Vietnam. Iwan. Yeah, thank you very much. It's an honor for me. Thanks thank a lot. You. It's an honor for us. Thank you, Iwan. Yeah. Compliments for your work. Then, Carlo Cristiano Stabile. Data analytics approaches for the distribution of enhanced perm features in heterogeneous carbonate reservoirs. Carlo Cristiano. Hi, hi everybody. I am very glad to be here today with you, with all of you. Thank you very Thanks much. A lot, Carlo, and compliments again for the work. Thank you again. And then Marco Teodori. Peak data processing for oil and gas pipeline integrity assessment. Marco. Hello, everybody. Thank you. It's an honor and uh, congratulations to all the winners. Thanks, Marco, and compliment for the good job. So, Marco was the last uh, special mention. Um, let's say I'm sorry for the impossibility to be more warm, let's say, in giving out the award, but this is the situation. And now we have a, a, a very interesting session because uh, five winners will have the opportunity to present their work in more detail. Uh, I think it will be very interesting, so I encourage all of you uh, attending on YouTube and LinkedIn and from wherever to follow this session because it's really at the core of the capabilities and the excellence of the work that has been done. So one after the other, starting from Luca Bianchi in the presentation of their great job. Thanks. So thank you, Alberto. 
will share my presentation in a while. Hopefully you go you could see it. Just give me a feedback, please, before yeah. we start. Okay, so really, uh, it's really a pleasure for me uh, uh, to be awarded with the Gustavo, Gustavo Sklocki uh, uh, thesis award. And uh, uh, during uh, the next 10 minutes, I will give you a flavor of the PhD thesis I discussed last September at the University of Trieste. The thesis is titled Low Frequency Reconstruction Methods for elastic parameter estimation. The thesis delved into the unsolved problems of the inversion of seismic reflection data for reservoir characterization. I proposed a set of sparsity-based algorithms to estimate the background trend of the elastic properties, showing application both on synthetic example and real cases. Okay. So the objective of the thesis is to infer the absolute value of the elastic properties from low dispersive wave fields that are recorded on the Earth's surface. In other words, the scientific question I tried to answer was whether reliable acoustic, elastic, and electromagnetic permittivity properties can be inferred from post-tac, pre-stack seismic data, and ground penetrating radar data, respectively. For the ones that may not be familiar with the seismic reflection method, an active source of pressure is fired behind the vault in this figure, and the wave field that bounces back to the streamer of receivers is recorded. As the boat moves forward, the wave fields investigate different points in the subsurface and the same points are illuminated from different incident samples. So the seismic experiment provides the data and the geological knowledge of the area may provide information on the rock physics relationships that holds in the specific context. An acoustic or elastic model, depending whether pre or post act data are available, is the most reasonable, reasonable outcome given the governing law provided by the Zebritz equations. Once the problem is set up as schematically shown, it seems obvious to pass from the model to the data through forward modeling or from the data to the explanatory model through inversion. However, two main challenges affect the inverse problems I studied. If only surface properties are available, so no well logs, seismic data are little informative of the low frequency content of the acoustic models. And if the elastic model, if a set of elastic models is to be inferred from pre-step data, the ambiguity between any set of these uh, of three elastic parameters must be solved too. In terms of missing low frequencies in seismic inversion, a spectral gap here exists between the informative content related to the reflectivity, which is estimated from seismic pulses, and the informative content related to move out velocity. I tried to fill the gap, making use of the hypothesis of sparsity in the subvertical sequence of the Earth reflectivity. I now show to you an overview of the results I achieved. I first focused on the estimate of the full band of the acoustic impedance when no well logs are available. The scope is to provide a means to detect the presence of source rocks in new exploration areas, as the richer source rocks are often coupled with lower acoustic impedance values. I developed the so-called combined autoregressive velocity method, where controlled amplitude, known phase, or stack seismic data are modeled as an autoregressive process 
for obtaining the bandwidth extension. A tailored regularization strategy allows the incorporation of the velocity field and geological constraints at depth in the full band estimate of the reflectivity. This estimate, in turn, allows for the full band estimate of the acoustic impedance. I show now the application of the algorithm on a sample uh, seismic section from the Atlantic margin of Shore Scotland. This is a publicly available data set. The traditional acoustic impedance inversion spatially smooths the background trend across wells, while the curve method highlights lateral variation of geological conformable geometry, like these pins, uh, uh, without making use of the low frequency information. This comes at the price of increasing the vertical stripes in the inverted section. However, the match at the two blind wells is comparable to the legacy case, which was constructed to meet the dual log information. I then investigated the possibility to classify the reservoir properties from pre stack data by estimating not only the absolute value of the acoustic impedance, but also the absolute value of other elastic properties, thus allowing to uh, better classify uh, different lithology and fluid content. I adopted the same autoregressive approach of the post act case to extend the seismic bandwidth to low frequencies for each incidence angle in the pre stack case. Then, a properly regularized version of the Aki Richards relationship has been used to map the amplitude versus angle response into the elastic parameters of VP, VS, and density, as you can see in the third panel here. The last topic I investigated in the thesis was the applicability of the sparsity based autoregressive methods for bandwidth extension in the case of the dielectric properties of glaciers. Glaciers are low dispersive media when investigating by ground penetrating radar weight field. But uh, given the uh, noisier nature of this kind of data, uh, no conclusive result has been obtained in the estimation of the geometry and the density of the ice bodies, therefore the water quantification. Oh. To sum up, an algorithm for the estimate of the absolute value of the acoustic impedance where no well logs are available is provided in the thesis. Attempts to estimate the dielectric properties of ice in glacier from ground penetrating radar data collected at the surface only are discussed. Two algorithms have been proposed for the estimate of elastic impedance and elastic properties from pre stack seismic data where no well logs are available. This innovation is coupled with the study on the stability of the three terms amplitude versus angle inversion, depending on the confidence on the rock physics correlation among the elastic parameters. I, I would like to conclude my talk on the philosophical side by citing a book from Maurizio Sacchi. He helped me in the research I carried out, but he was not the only one to help. So I would also thank Michele Pipan, Emanuele Forte, and Vittorio De Tommasi. As you could have appreciated along the presentation, during the PhD, I imagined a lot of things in the framework of inverse problems, and I tried to choose the cost function to single out the best model among the infinity of admissible ones. I did it for the algorithms, and I hope I did the same for the remaining things as well. Thanks, Luca. Let's go immediately to the second presentation, Justin, as a continuous flow of presentation. Margherita. Yes, I'm trying to share my presentation. Okay. 
Can you see it? Perfectly, thanks. Okay. Good evening. Today I'm presenting my master thesis work named the BYF Finance, an eco friendly alternative to ordinary fossil finance. This work is the result of a master um, of an Erasmus friendship to place uh, in Malaga last year. The world is facing an unprecedented environmental crisis, which would be the very well known reality of the human induced climate change caused mainly by greenhouse gases, such as the CO2. Among the others, the Portland cement industry is um, one of the main sources of uh, CO2 emission into the atmosphere, for uh, it accounts for 5 to 7 percent of global anthropogenic emissions. And um, we are now working on strategies to reduce the environmental impact associated. One alternative could be the replacement of the pollutants for some cement with the so-called eco-cement. And one particular formulation of this uh, cement are the Belite the, the light Ferrite cement, or BYF for short, um, that um, are named uh, from the three main phases and studied in this work. The production of uh, BYF cement released about 22% uh, less CO2 into the atmosphere compared with Portland cement for the absence of the phase alive and uh, the reduction of limestone used uh, as a raw material and includes uh, also additional energy savings. However, this type of uh, cement still uh, show big technological problems not negligible associated with low mechanical strength at early and intermediate migration uh, ages. One possible solution uh, studied uh, in my work is the, um, the use of activation activity uh, um, added to the cement to accelerate the aggression of phases and to improve uh, the mechanical properties. The objectives of my work were to highlight the real emergency of climate change and the environmental impact of humans and cement production. And also to, stu to study the effect of uh, two activation mixtures, calcium chloride and PIPA, on the rheological and uh, adaptation behavior of uh, DYF cement to verify the potential improvement in mechanical properties. Earth's climate system is powered by incoming uh, solar radiation, partly absorbed by greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, uh, like, um, for example, CO2 and methane, contributing to the well-known greenhouse effect. Humans play an active role in this process, for it directly emits greenhouse gases into the atmosphere uh, and contribute to the global warming, in such high quantities that we started to talk about the Anthropocene, a possible new geological era. Right now, there's a widespread uh, consensus above uh, the, all the scientific community behind the multiple lines of um, evidence of climate change uh, coming from direct and indirect uh, measures and uh, confirming that the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases has increased and continues to increase really fast since uh, the beginning of the industrial era when we started to burn fossil fuels. And CO2 is now reaching uh, 470 parts per million uh, of concentration into the atmosphere. And also the soil and ocean temperature are rising with a rate never been so fast in all uh, human history. The most famous greenhouse gases of all is, uh, of course, carbon dioxide that contributes to the greenhouse effect in a unique way. And uh, it increased from uh, 2 billion tons to over um, 36 billion tons uh, in 2019. And since the first industrial revolution, the world has emitted over 1.5 billion tons of CO2. The two main sources of the global CO2 emitted are both natural and anthropogenic. And in my work, I focus on the cement industry that is a um, massive greenhouse gas producer for its account 
for 5 to 7 percent of global anthropogenic emissions. In fact, one ton of cement uh, releases um, almost 0 0.9 tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, coming mainly from fossil fuel emissions and process related emissions. Cement is manufactured inside rotary teams in three distinct phases, in which the first is the main responsible for the emission, coming from the decomposition of limestone calcite in a process called calcining, where calcium carbonate is split into calcium oxide and carbon uh, dioxide, as we can see in this graph. During the hydration of cement, several internal reactions take place and uh, they can be accelerated using the activation admixture to accelerate also the early strength development. In my work, we selected uh, calcium chloride and uh, PIPA as activation admixture to accelerate respectively the hydration of uh, the phases, the light and ferrite. As I previously mentioned, one potential alternative to ordinary formal cements are the so called eco cements also indicated in the project Drawdown Climate Solution. And this uh, type of material are um, formulated with the, the, the idea of using different raw materials that require less energy and emit less CO2 overall. The world of eco cement is vast and very you know, expansion. And in this table, we can see some examples of formulation. And uh, in my project, I focused on the BYF uh, cement. Talking about the experimental part of my work, firstly, we pre pre prepared the uh, um, BYF eco cement uh, sample in the laboratory in Malaga from uh, a standard BYF filter. Then we selected uh, the optimum amount of super plastic sizes added to the cement to lower the viscosity and obtain workable samples. And successfully, we studied the behavior of, of two activation admixtures selected, calcium chloride and PIPA, added in different amounts and order of addition. We then measured the neurological behavior of uh, each formulation in a viscometer. Uh, and then we uh, proceeded with the hydration uh, that uh, was stopped after one and seven days to then uh, characterize the cases with uh, um, uh, X-ray powder diffraction to identify the cases and thermal analysis. The goals of rheological study uh, were to have uh, adequate time to prepare workable cases and to see a viscosity increase at early ages. As we can see in these two graphs, we, we see um, an increase, a quick increase after uh, 40 minutes of hydration and um, allowing us to prepare homogeneous phases. And we also selected uh, two BYF formulations activated with uh, calcium chloride and PIPA that uh, showed um, uh, an increasing of viscosity after 70 minutes for further characterization. The result of uh, thermogravimetric analysis after one and seven days of hydration are presented in this slide, where we can see that the major signals uh, are caused by the two phases, uh, ethringite that increases the early strength development, and stratlingite that doesn't affect the mechanical strength. The evolution of phases uh, during the hydration was followed through visual uh, quantitative phase analysis with the results shown in the three tables, where we can see in pink the main phases consumed to form the new phases uh, in light blue, with the reaction degrees indicated inside the toolboxes. In this slide, we can see the evolution of phases with time in the three um, BYM formulations selected from zero to seven days of regression. And we can see that the etching guide, AFP in the graph, is uh, higher in the two activated BYF formulations. In conclusion, with my project, I wanted to highlight the environmental impact of humans and the cement industry uh, in a climate-changing world. 
and also to study and present a potential eco-friendly alternative to ordinary portland cement, the so-called BYR cement, activated with two external activation admixtures to improve their mechanical properties and early ages. We used uh, different uh, characterization techniques uh, on the pastes, and we saw that the addition of calcium chloride and uh, TIPA has, uh, in fact, amplified the hydration reaction of pastes and uh, uh, with an increase in UV viscosity. The main crystalline compounds that form and uh, that are responsible for the improvement in mechanical strength are ethringite and calcite both presented in the activator BYF. However, further research on BYF eco cements are needed also to fully understand the potential of this type of cement to replace the Portland for large-scale application and also to try to reduce the associated cost. Thank you all for the attention. Thanks a lot, Margherita. The next one should be Chiara Zuffetti, am I right? Yes. Great, Chiara. I'm sharing the screen. Yours. We can see it. You see the, the presentation? Yes. Okay. So thank you again for this opportunity and uh, to share my research. Uh, my PhD project in the University of Milan uh, dealt with the 3D characterization of complex uh, geological architectures. I focus on the quaternary sedimentary field of the Po Basin in Lombardy, where I set up a multidisciplinary method, integrating geological fieldwork, well log correlations, and software based 3D computations. We will see how it is possible to incorporate the interpreted geohistory into reservoir models predisposed to flow and transport predictions at different scales. And now just to understand why it's important to um, focus on the Po Basin. So why I choose this area? First of all, first of all because the, the Po Basin hosts a multi-layered groundwater reservoirs of quaternary age. And so knowing uh, their 3D architecture is fundamental for hydrogeological and geothermal applications to understand the distribution and connectivity of aquifers at different scales. But at present, no multi-scale reconstructions of quaternary geology exist in this area. Second, the area allows uh, to unravel the quaternary geological evolution of the Pobesi since it locates in the interference zone between alpine sourced glacial fluvial and alluvial systems and Apennine advancing arcs, whose chronology is still debated in literature. I focus on the southernmost isolated hill of the Po Plain, shaped during Apennine thrusting at the buried structural culminations, this yellow arc in the figures since the late Miocene. The hills are key sectors to constrain geological reconstructions as they expose geological boundaries and units otherwise buried in the adjacent plain. And in urbanized landscapes like this, 3D modeling relies on poor surface exposures and on well log data, hard data. In order to propagate the sedimentary heterogeneity in space, we need to know both the stratigraphic geometries and the evolution through time, which controls the nested geometries, so having a strong implication in hydrogeology. However, no existing modeling software still incorporates the soft evolutionary information as explicit constraint for, uh, in the modeling procedure. So the aims of my work are to reconstruct the quaternary geological architecture of the southern Po Basin, to propose a method combining hard and soft geological information um, into 3D multi-scale geological models. To do that, I set up a multidisciplinary methodology, starting from geological fieldwork 
and collection of subsurface data, followed by the analysis of more than 100 outcrops, these green dots in the map, and of more than 500 borehole data that I normalized and analyzed in 1D. I produced uh, new geological maps and landscape reconstructions integrated into stratigraphic cross sections along these brown lines that you see in the map. From the resulting geological model, I set up new geomodeling rules to compute quantitative 3D models coherent with the 4D evolution of the basin. So I will show now some results on the geological reconstruction first, and then the 3D geological models. From the surface geological mapping and subsurface correlation derives a new hierarchic stratigraphic scheme comprising five high rank unconformities, U1 to U5. They bound the regressive sedimentary fill of the basin during Quaternary from the marine Calabrian units up to the glacial fluvial and alluvial cycles of the middle and late Pleistocene. In the subsurface, the overall geometry shows progressive thinning and truncations towards the structural height. And at the most elevated San Colombano hill, this one in the map, uh, folds dissect the late Pleistocene units and older units, and I mapped this fold. At, uh, and uh, so this architecture allows us to interpret the incremental geological and landscape evolution through time. Before the late Pleistocene, three main stages of northward propagation of the Apennine rampant declines shaped the older unconformity. This uh, seen the positional tectonics is deduced from pinch out geometries towards the uplifting sectors and from the existence of angular unconformities of high hierarchy like U3 with composite surfaces formed during increments of the position and the formation. The late Pleistocene evolution is characterized by a stage of branching, uplift, and extension, which produced the high rank and conformity U4 and shaped the present day landscape. I recognized the different tectonal depositional steps at the origin of intermediate rank surfaces, S1 to S4, that compose the high rank one. So let's see some evidence from the San Colombano Hill area. This, the hill is this border in white. And uh, just to see how I combine surface and subsurface data. S1 originated during thrusting, folding, and uplift at the San Colombano Hill. Um, in the subsurface, S1 bounds glacial fluvial systems, which amalgamate and backstep approaching the uplifting sectors. The same trend is observed in outcrops where thickness variations and amalgamations upwards coupled with soft sediment deformation structures indicate seen the positional tectonics. New tectonic increment originated S2, bounding glacial fluvial terraces on the plain and paleo valleys on the hill. The latter testify that a first relief, topographic relief, elevated above the plain during this step. During the last glacial maximum, glacial fluvial progradation terraced the hill at S3, contemporaneously with the first hill dissection by folds. Evidence of faulting of these sediments are apparent at the hill slopes. So we move here at the hill slopes, where lots of sediment deformations occur in correspondence of morphological indicators of active folds, like polygonal facets, aligned valley diversions, and valley truncations, all coherent with direct fault measurements in the field. Then S4 bounds alluvial terraces formed during an early post-glacial phase of tectonic stability. Here you see the traces 
uh, of rivers crossing the plain during the, this stage. These rivers have been diverted and entrenched at S5 since the post glacial. Here you see the southward shifting of the Po River and the recent most river diversions in blue along the same di directions of the folds that I mapped on the hill. It testifies an ongoing stage of regional uplift at hill and the hill collapse uh, at these folds. So all this knowledge uh, have been used to constrain the 3D computation. And I tried to translate this knowledge into rules for modeling. To do that, I, um, I translated the hierarchy and relative chron chronology like attributes to the line drawing on cross section. And I implemented new GIS tools to obtain 3D point at the intersections between boreholes so the hard geological data and the stratigraphic boundaries interpreted with my knowledge. So we need models incorporating three levels of hierarchy, high rank, intermediate rank, and low rank, starting from these constraints. I use the GeoModeler software, which needs information on reference surface, where to set the algorithm and the vertical ordering of the geological unit to be computed. But in the classic approach, when you run this algorithm, uh, you just obtain one rank. Hence, I set up a new modeling routine by implementing two hierarchic rules, which combine these information. The results are 3D quantitative models of the study area, which preserve the interpreted hierarchic architecture. Here we see the high rank and intermediate rank modeled units coherent with the line drawing in, in two dimensions. And here, the low rank geometries. Notice how they are coherent with the incremental history interpreted in the area. For example, here, they interpreted progressive on laps and folding during the Middle Pleistocene. In conclusion, recalling in the top left uh, the, the aims of my research, I reconstructed a new hierarchic architectural model of the Southern Pop Basin, where the high rank and conformities are tectonic driven composite time transgressive surfaces. I propose a new evolution of the San Colombano hill comprising folding until the late Pleistocene and followed by uplift and fault-driven collapse. And uh, it was possible by setting up an integrated method combining field and subsurface geological investigation. Then I realized the new quantitative models accounting for the geological interpretation. Their hierarchic structure allows upscaling and downscaling operation preserving the coherent geometries. And I proposed a methodological improvement by conceptualizing the knowledge on basin evolution into explicit modeling rules. Implications of this research concern the quaternary geology, since uh, the new maps and stratigraphic scheme integrate the geological map of Italy in sector where it is lacking. The work gives insights on the possible seismogenic potential of the map the quaternary faults and the new automated tools for 3D modeling can be implemented for, from the proposed procedure. The models are also predisposed to orient stochastic simulations of the internal heterogeneities to set up reliable flow and transport models at any scale. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chiara. Chiara Zuffetti, again, compliments. And the next is Giuseppe Battista Abate. Abate. Yes, let me share the screen. Okay. He starts to work. Great, fine. Okay, perfect. Go on. So, Thank you, Alberto, and thanks to all associations for uh, organizing such a uh, great event. 
Uh, my thesis uh, is related uh, to the experience I made while working on um, in the Cypem offshore drilling uh, as innovation in, in the innovation management and uh, studying in the Vienna U University of Economics and Business. And uh, it is related to the definition and implementation of a predictive maintenance uh, uh, strategy and also presents uh, um, a way to manage uh, new technology trends. So uh, by going deeply uh, to, the, to the agenda, briefly to the agenda, uh, I will start with a, a brief introduction on the oil and gas digitalization, uh, one slide on the stakeholder analysis, and then I will present, of course, the key parameters of the predictive maintenance uh, for such a particular environment. And finally, I will go uh, through the uh, framework for the technology uh, trend management. So first of all, uh, why is it important to talk about uh, uh, predictive maintenance? As we can see from this uh, PwC uh, report, there are a lot uh, of technologies that uh, a digital upstream industry has to take uh, care in, the, in these days. But uh, there are uh, in particular uh, two technologies, which are the digital twins and the predictive maintenance, which is expected to, to change the uh, upstream industry in very short term. So that's the reason why we concentrated also on the predictive maintenance. A second uh, report uh, from Deloitte um, um, explained uh, the technological status of uh, every uh, industry segment, which is the exploration, development and production, and uh, uh, exploit uh, how, um, where is the journey to the, to, the, um, to the digitalization of such a segment. Basically, it is divided in three phases. So the first phase is related to the um, sensorization of the of the equipment. The second phase is related to the analytics, uh, and the third phase is related to the application and uh, implementation of um, uh, decision taken by the analytics. Basically, we can see that uh, for the exploratory drilling, where uh, my company uh, sets off, is uh, uh, we are in the phase of uh, having sensorized a lot of component. Uh, to improve the uh, productivity of the equipment. And we are now in the phase of uh, collecting uh, and transmitting this data. Uh, this slide wants to tell that uh, the IoT infrastructure is a key enabler for this technology. And that's the reason why a lot of implementation in this uh, uh, upstream industry are taking uh, effect. Another slide from BCG uh, talks about, uh, of course, the figures and savings uh, on the on the industry thanks to digitalization efforts. And we can see that uh, for drilling, uh, um, for the drilling segment, uh, it is expected to have a 20 to 30 percent cost reduction thanks to automation and uh, analytics in order to 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 improve uh, the, the the well construction. So going briefly to the stakeholder analysis from the drilling contractor point of view, we can see that uh, uh, the first, of course, important uh, um, stakeholder is the energy company, uh, so our client. Of course, for, a, for an energy company, uh, contracting uh, a drilling contractor that has um, implements a predictive maintenance strategy means to have uh, uh, less non-proactive time, and that is obvious. But uh, it also improves the HSC performances because, of course, a fault can lead to uh, damages, to severe damages, both to personnel and to, uh, to the environment. A second important uh, stakeholder are the original equipment manufacturer because in such a, great, uh, such a regulated industry, uh, the original equipment manufacturer currently uh, rely a lot uh, on the uh, incomes coming from the uh, um, certification and service model. But uh, as soon as a drilling contractor will implement the predictive maintenance strategy, then the OEM will be forced to change their business model. The last stakeholder is uh, uh, related to the third party institution, which may include uh, Lloyds, for example, rig acceptance uh, companies or insurances. And basically their task is to start accepting the predictive maintenance uh, uh, strategy as uh, uh, valid as, as it is now for the preventive maintenance. So now let's go uh, briefly on the key dimensions for the predictive maintenance. Uh, and let's start from the business uh, uh, dimensions first. The first is, of course, the usual question uh, is the make or buy decision. So if you really want to have an internal uh, data scientist uh, building the, your predictive maintenance algorithm, and in our case, we figure out that uh, you can find a lot of data scientists on the, on the market uh, specializing in predictive maintenance. So it is better to buy these skills and instead keeping your predictive maintenance, your uh, data scientist uh, 
building algorithm for something that is really important and customized for your company. The second, the second parameter is related to the type of company you want to partner with. So if you want to partner with a startup, then you may, you may have a, a state-of-the-art uh, uh, algorithm and technology, but they might have some uh, problems in supporting uh, your operations all over the world and in our environment as it is on the offshore drilling. So basically we decided to go through uh, the uh, corporations. The third dimension is related to the, to the business model of such partner. And basically we saw that there are uh, two uh, main clusters, which is pay by tag or pay by equipment, and this choice is strictly re related to the uh, status, technology status of uh, of the rig. Um, the last dimension is related to the uh, open model uh, or closed model decision, and it is related, of course, to the fact uh, to the to the question you have to make if you want to have a look inside the algorithm, and most of the time you want to have a look inside the algorithm that you are buying. Uh, by going uh, to the uh, key dimensions from the technical point of view, we can see that there are four more uh, dimensions, important dimensions, and it is related to the decision that you have to make uh, of, uh, on, on the fault, uh, on the type of detection that you want to make. All the companies, of course, like to have a real detection, but what we figure out is that at the beginning, uh, it is very complicated to have a, 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 in a, um, a great set of recorded fault that allow you to uh, train the, 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 the data science model. So uh, we needed to start from an anomaly detection and then go through the fault detection. A second dimension is, of course, if you want to rely on or on edge or cloud um, technologies. And in our case, since we operate in our environment, we needed for sure to operate uh, to, to use edge technologies. Uh, third dimension is related to the type of data that you want to use. So uh, at the beginning, we started with the PLC data. Or, uh, so the data that are already available for the automation and the control of the equipment. Uh, but we know that in the short term, we will need to to, to switch to new sensors in order to have greater uh, fault detection. The last dimension is related to the decision if you want to apply the predictive maintenance only on capital equipment or on all equipment, for example, all electric motors that you have on, on the rig. Based on this, you, the, de the development of the algorithm will definitely change. In our case, we selected the capital equipment because of, in, the, in that case, the business case could uh, hold. So uh, concerning the last slide and the framework to manage the technology trend, it is first important to understand why it is important to manage a technology trend. Uh, we can do that by an example. If we consider that uh, an engineer on a company does need to buy a valve, most probably uh, all the parameters of such valve are very well described. But uh, if a company needs to manage a new, predictive, a new uh, technology trends, then such parameters and features may not be available. And therefore, the effort of the company will need to focus in order to find, first of all, all these key feature understanding, but, but uh, key features. But the problem is that uh, in order to not lose time, we cannot wait in the innovation management to have all the features of a technology trends available, because otherwise we would be too late. That's the reason why uh, I propose this framework uh, to manage the technology trends. Uh, that means to start by doing a, a brief POC on a, um, focusing on the first uh, uh, features that uh, uh, seems relevant at the beginning of the technology trend. For the predictive maintenance case, for example, it was uh, for us to test if we had enough data to do predictive maintenance on our equipment and if we could deploy edge technologies on our rigs. Uh, after the first POC, uh, which uh, seemed uh, successful, we found out that there were a lot of uh, more features and that uh, allowed us to uh, explore a little bit more the technology trend and found out, find out new, uh, new features. Of course, after four to five rounds, uh, you, find your, uh, you can find uh, um, a set of features which are really customized on the technology trend, but for your own company. And that means that uh, you are really starting to have building capabilities for that technological trend. So the benefit of having such um, framework in place is to minimize, uh, to minimize the resources for tenant trend exploration, its cost and human capital, but also increase internal competencies uh, in an incremental way, but also scale up when you really know what you're doing. So when you really know what the technology trends means and uh, uh, so that you cannot only rely on external sources. 
So basically that was the last slide. If you have any question or um, other information you want to other information, you feel free to send me an email. And thank you once again. Thanks a lot, Giuseppe. Compliments again for the job. And now the last presentation from Ahmed Del Gendi. Ahmed? Yes. Great. Yes, Alberto, I'm here. Just let me a uh, moment to uh, share my uh, presentation. Please let me know when you see it. It, it came. Fine. Okay, uh, good afternoon, good evening for everyone. Uh, before I start, I would like to uh, thank SPE, EAGE and uh, Somenirarya for, uh, let's say, being part and organizing the award for almost three decades till now. The project title, as you can see, is Carbon Capture and Storage Modeling Perspective. Uh, the work uh, took almost three months uh, and uh, it was uh, part of a collaboration between uh, Politecnico di Torino and uh, FA. The idea of the project was to find the new solutions able to couple Jesuit chemistry uh, with the, the dynamic standard model for better prediction and uh, simulation for uh, several chemi chemical and physical processes that and phenomena uh, that might happen during the and after the CO2 uh, injection. Uh, here you can see uh, the background, uh, the agenda of my presentation. I would like uh, to take a couple of, min of minutes to profound clearly the problem, and then we will see the workflow proposed for the coupling, and then we will stop at some, let's say, parts of the result of the work, and then we will go to the conclusion. So, uh, starting from here, so any carbon storage study, let's say, uh, has to answer some uh, uh, specific questions uh, under different categories. So we need to know um, uh, how much we can store from the CO2 in our reservoir. We need to know where uh, the CO2 plume will evolve and will uh, flow in our reservoir. We need also to evaluate uh, the different risks of having leakage maybe uh, during the, inj the injection or even after vertically or laterally. And also we need to know how much uh, or how fast we can inject the CO2 in our reservoir. Um, so here uh, we um, can see this is uh, the, um, the reservoir or the case study that the project has been working on. It's a gas depleted reservoir of Shore 1. It has been producing since the 60s and it has three main uh, reservoirs, H1, H2, H3. However, the work will be uh, focused uh, on uh, H1 uh, formation uh, only. Uh, so a previous study with a conventional uh, standard reservoir simulator for oil and gas companies uh, intersect has been, uh, let's say a previous work has been done on, on the project. However, with intersect, uh, it, can, it could only uh, fully answer some of the questions uh, re related to the monitorability and also the hydrodynamics. However, for other parts uh, like capacity injectivity and containment, let's say it cannot uh, in a reliable way give a uh, uh, give an answer to uh, those questions. So, and here it comes is the, the, um, the, the purpose of the work is to uh, uh, build a geochemistry model coupled with the dynamic model in order to can uh, simulate uh, the physics and the chemistry that maybe the conventional reservoir simulator uh, cannot or disregard, uh, let's say, those phenomena. Uh, and we will be focused on the injectivity related risks. So to give you an overview for this uh, type of chemical and physical phenomena that they are happening, I mean, we need from the simulator, from the chemistry model, let's say, to model the CO2 solubility in the formation water. We need uh, to uh, simulate the water vaporization phenomena. We need to, uh, to, uh, to simulate the mineral alteration, dissolution and precipitation and also other uh, processes. We can divide those uh, to, let's say, chemical part and physical part. The chemical part, basically, it's about the mineralogy change, uh, which will affect the porosity and the permeability, and finally may affect the injectivity. 
On the other hand, the physics part presented here in the by the water vaporization may change the saturation, may also uh, cause a precipitation here. However, this precipitation is uh, due to the water vaporization, not due to a chemical reactions. Uh, or consequently, this will change the porosity permeability, but also the relative permeability, uh, which eventually will also affect our injectivity. So to uh, let's say to make this coupling, the thesis work has let's say used two basic softwares. The GEM, it's a unconventional and uh, compositional reservoir simulator, and frequency, it's a on chemical code. So to do this, uh, let's uh, take a look on the workflow. The workflow has uh, let's say three macro steps or sections. The first step is about to have in hand all the required data to build the geochemistry and the dynamic model. Here we can see that there are, let's say, new pieces of information or input data that is a standard dynamic simulation, uh, let's say, uh, doesn't need, like the water composition, uh, thermodynamic and kinetic parameters, and also the rock mineralogy. However, the second step is about to uh, the definition of the chemical reaction and the construction of the kinetic model. Uh, but also there is a step uh, to verify if uh, if the software gem is able to uh, have the same um, results uh, of uh, the frequency one. And the last step is uh, to uh, build the 2D radial model uh, for the purpose of, of, uh, of performing sensitivity analysis to identify the most critical uh, um, parameters, operational, but also modeling parameters on the injectivity. In the next few slides, we will go uh, through step two and step three. For step two, uh, generally speaking, the geochemical model, uh, let's say there is two ways of constructing a geochemical model, an equilibrium and the kinetic one. For the equilibrium, uh, by definition, we assume that our system uh, reaches an equilibrium from time zero. So it's a, it's, it's a simpler model uh, and it, it needs less input data and uh, less uncertainties, obviously. But uh, the problem here is that it's only applicable on the long time scale. On the other hand, the kinetic one, um, it can, uh, let's say, simulate what's happening in our uh, system uh, in time but it's more complex, it needs more data, more uncertainties related to those data, and uh, the advantage is because it's applicable for both short and long time scales. So one of the fundamental idea of this step here is to start building the equilibrium uh, model, uh, let's say to identify the main uh, chemical reactions by uh, evaluating the most altered minerals uh, during the CO2 injection, and then study those minerals or those reactions by uh, from a kinetic point of view, to build the kinetic model and finally implement it or couple it with uh, the dynamic one. Uh, here, the verification steps that we have seen in the workflow, it's um, you can see both reaction systems that has been identified. Uh, the clastic reaction system and the carbonatic reaction system. The clastic is basically the albedo solution with the precipitation of the zonite and quartz. You can see it on uh, the left, over on the right, you can see the carbonatic one with the ancrite uh, dissolution and the precipitation of the siderite, calcite, magnesite. We can see that GEM is able to, uh, let's say, identify uh, which mineral will dissolute and which mineral will precipitate uh, correctly respect to frequency, but there are some differences in the quantification of the dissoluted and or precipitated mineral uh, moles of the minerals. And this is basically due to two reasons. Uh, uh, two, the two softwares or the two codes, they are using different thermodynamic databases, but also the uh, solubility model in GEM is more complex than the one implemented in FreeQC due to that uh, the solubility model in GEM is a, it's a function of the pressure temperature but also uh, the salinity. For uh, step number three, here uh, I would like to share with you some, let's say, of the parameters that uh, they suffer from uncertainties. Uh, uh, some of those parameters were, uh, uh, let's say, analyzed by global sensitivity analysis by the calculation of the Sobel index. Uh, because they have range of values, uh, and we can use those, uh, let's say, um, approaches to 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 evaluate uh, their effect on the injectivity. However, there are parameters or cases like the water vaporization, the case based sensitivity. Uh, I mean here is that we run a simulation without the water vaporization, and with the water vaporization, we see the differences. 
the um, let's say the sensitivity analysis are based on the 2D uh, radial thermal reactive transport model uh, because it's uh, let's say it's much, it's much faster to do hundreds of simulations on a 2D than to do it on a 3D. However, we will see some uh, uh, let's say uh, results of the 3D later. Also, I would like here to say that the ancrite was uh, the mineral included in the sensitivity analysis since it was the most mineral that uh, suffered from uncertainty. Here I would like to share with you the Sobel index calculation. Um, I, um, I think it's nice to show this kind of results because the Sobel index not only can uh, show us, uh, let's say, the main effect for each parameter, uh, linear and nonlinear, but also the interaction uh, between the different parameters. Um, so the, the results that you, we see on the right, it's based on 122 experiments and with the range of uh, the parameters, the range of values that you can see it from the table. We can see from the results on the right that uh, the CO2 injection temperature and the uh, uh, reducible or the initial water saturation, they have the major impact on the injectivity, uh, but also we can, as I said, quantify and visualize uh, the interaction uh, between those parameters, those, let's say this type of, of, of results are, uh, yeah, they, they help us in order to can understand the physics correlated between uh, the parameters of our model. Um, then we go to uh, show you some results of the 3D uh, dynamic model. So you can see on the right here the H1 reservoir dynamic model, uh, um, geological model for uh, the porosity of it with a zoom on the, let's say, the area of uh, where we are planned to um, drill three injectors uh, to store the CO2. Uh, the three injectors, you can see that they are in the area with high porosity for obvious reasons that uh, we have high porosity, high injectivity. Uh, also on the left, you can see some of the information of the, um, of the model that uh, the 3D model coupled with the uh, geochemical one, both is on the plastic and the carbonatic reactions network but also the water vaporization are modeled. Also, we have done a previous, let's say, before the injection, a thermal history match in GEM and compared those intersect, but uh, unfortunately we can, um, there's no time to show this um, the history match here. The injection scheme, you can see also the maximum uh, storage capacity of the CO2 in the H1 uh, uh, formation, and also we can see the maximum injection target very well. Um, but what I want to focus here is the injection scenarios because um, let's say it's a well-known problem, uh, the phase transition of the CO2 in the well bore for uh, those of you who are working uh, flow assurance or even in the reservoir simulation that during the injection, especially in the depleted gas reservoirs, we may have a phase transition in the well bore. So the CO2 will change from gas to liquid. Um, and it's not easy, let's say, to, uh, from a simulation point of view. So those two scenarios is to show the difference if, uh, if between two cases. One, when we have the phase transition, and, when, uh, and the other, when we don't have the phase transition. To do so, we have, uh, let's say, uh, by using two uh, VFPs. Uh, vertical flow performance, it's a relation between the gas flow rate, you can see it on the x-axis, and the bottom hole pressure on the y-axis at different well head pressures. Uh, on the left, you can see um, the CO2 gas phase uh, VFP, and on the right, you can see uh, the CO2 liquid phase VFP that has been constructed by PROSPER. The blank area that you can see, it, let's say, in the middle or the white area is due to the transient effect that, uh, let's say, a steady state uh, simulator li uh, like uh, PROSPER cannot see. But for uh, the no phase transition, so basically we will only use the VFP uh, table for, uh, tables or curves for, for the gas. But for the phase transition, we implemented a trigger criteria in order to can shift or move uh, from the gas phase uh, VFP to the liquid phase VFP. So the simulator uh, at uh, if, uh, for, e for, e for each injector when the bottom hole pressure reached to a uh, specified uh, pressure, which we, uh, let's say, believe that at this pressure, at uh, this, this temperature, we reach to uh, the phase boundary. So we, uh, the simulator will shift from the gas phase to uh, the liquid phase uh, VFPs. Here we can see the results of uh, the two scenarios. Uh, we can see in blue the wellhead pressure, and we can see in red uh, the gas rate. In the no-phase transition, the wellhead pressure is increasing smoothly. So, and this is basically due to uh, the well bore as um, the CO2 uh, is in the gas phase in the well bore during the injection period. 
However, on the phase transition scenario on the right, we can see that in October 2026, there will be um, an abrupt, let's say, increase in the wellhead pressure uh, to maintain the injection scheme or the, um, the capacity that we, we need to store. Uh, and this is due to uh, the phase uh, transition of the CO2 from the gas to liquid in the well pore. We can see that the maximum value of the wellhead pressure for the new phase transition is 1050 BC but for the phase transition, it's 1,300 BCI. So the no-phase transition saves, um, let's see, energy needed uh, to uh, inject the CO2. However, for the no-phase, we need to have a preheated CO2 uh, before the injection. By this results, I think I can conclude the presentation uh, that uh, what we have seen uh, so far is um, we have seen a procedure or a workflow uh, to construct a complex kinetic geochemical model starting from a thermodynamic equilibrium one. Also, we have seen that uh, the composition of our simulator gem, uh, the, uh, it um, say has the geochemistry capability in order to can uh, simulate the carbon sequestration for sure, uh, in addition to the dynamic part. We can see, we saw the results of the Sobel index is that uh, the injection uh, uh, temperature, uh, bottom hole injection temperature of the CO2 and the initial water saturation, they have the major and significant impact on the well injectivity. Uh, also, the, let's say the changes in the petrophysics, of and permeability, uh, for sure they are case dependent because they depend, uh, they depend on our uh, rock mineralogy we depend, uh, and also they depend on the, uh, the water composition. Uh, however, the mineral alteration seems to be, uh, let's say, negligible or not effective in the time scale of injection, since the chemical uh, reaction they are very slow, and uh, we need a bigger time scale in order to can see the, their effects on the porosity and uh, the permeability of the reservoir. Also, we saw that the no phase transition injection scenario shows a 15% less required wellhead pressure respect to the phase transition scenario. However, the CO2 should be, uh, let's say, preheated before. So here's it's kind of a trade-off between two uh, scenarios and we need to find, let's say, the optimum uh, case uh, between both of them. Um, here I would like to thank you for your attending. Uh, if you have any uh, questions or uh, let's say you're curious about to, do, to know more about the work, you can contact me uh, via the email that you see below. And um, uh, thanks again. I will be happy for sure to answer any of your questions. Thanks again. Great, uh, Ahmed. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation and and, uh, and compliments again. Now this uh, ceremony has come to a conclusion. It's time to thank to thank Politecnico di Milano for their virtual aula magna. It's time to thank the three organizing section section uh, sorry organizations SP Italian section, IAG Seg Sezione Italiana, and Asso Mineraria. Uh, Thanks for the people who try to organize and put together this event, which is always a, a rather tricky thing to do. And thanks to our winners. I mean, uh, given the moment, uh, I hope you have been, um, let's say, infected by their enthusiasm and attention to quality. Just as a last thought, uh, I understood most likely 20% at most of what I heard. But I think that this is a very good thing. It's very good because when you realize that there is a huge breadth and depth of knowledge that is required, that you understand that you need to be part of a community, a community of uh, engaged, knowledgeable, reliable specialists. And these communities are what our uh, associations are trying to build on a day-by-day -day basis. So just uh, see you on uh, Gustavo Sklocki Thesis Award 28 next year. And now bye-bye and cheers from all of us. Thanks a lot. Bye.